That's one of them old songs. That's the kind of singing they do in the country. But even if you're in the city, you ought to tell the Lord thank you. If he's done anything for you, you ought to tell him thank you. Not just during Thanksgiving, but every day you ought to tell him thank you. What a blessing. Amen and amen. What a blessing. Thank you, Brother Arthur, for sharing with us. I can't pay the Lord, but I sure enough can tell him, thank you, sir. And if that won't do it, you can say much obliged, because he has been good, hasn't he? He has been good, hasn't he? Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter number 3. I want to pick up where we left off on last week. Revelation chapter number 3, beginning with verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. If you have it, say amen. If you're still looking, say wait a minute. All right, we're all there. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to talk about check your vitals. Check your vitals. I want to remind you this series, you are the church. And I want you to repeat after me, I am the church. God bless you. I am the church. So when you leave out of here and go to dinner, Remember, I am the church. When you go to work tomorrow, remember, I am the church. When you go to school tomorrow, remember, I am the church. Wherever you go this week, you remember, I am the church. So when you go somewhere, just envision you are Mount Zion. First Baptist, wherever you go. So if you cuss somebody out this week, remember you are Mount Zion First Baptist. If you slap somebody in the face this week, remember you are Mount Zion First Baptist. But not only are you Mount Zion First Baptist, you are Jesus incarnate. Wherever you go, you represent Jesus. When you look at this text, it's an interesting letter that Paul writes, I mean, that the Bible says John writes about the church at Sardis. And every year in August, I go for my physical. First thing they do, they stop me off at the scale. They check my weight. Then they take me to a room. They check my blood pressure. They check my temperature. I'm healthy. Nothing's wrong. But every time I go, they go through the same procedure. Am I talking to anybody? My brothers and sisters, vital signs are used to measure the body's basic functions. These measurements are taken to help assess the general physical health of a person. It gives clues to a possible disease. It shows progress toward recovery. And the normal ranges for a person's vital signs, they vary with age. They vary with weight. They vary with gender and overall health. And there are four 
main vital signs. Body temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and respiratory rate. And I thought about if we could check our vital signs. What about our spiritual vital signs? How are we doing spiritually? After all, you come to church every Sunday. You sit on your favorite pew. You tithe. You sing. You lift your hands. You might even shout. But how are your spiritual vital signs? Jesus is looking at the church at Sardis. And he's checking her vital signs. Sardis is the capital city of Lydia. It was a well-fortified city. It was easily defended. However, it was affected by disease called complacency. L last week, we looked at the church, and its issue was toleration. But this week, we're looking at a different church, and it's caught up in complacency. It's complacent in the fact that it's in Sardis. It's complacent because it relies on its past glory. And they are like whitewashed ton ton uh, tombs, whitewashed tombs. You know how it is when you whitewash tombs in a cemetery. They look real pretty and clean. But underneath the tomb, the corpse is dead. In other words, you look good, but on the inside, you're dying. Am I talking to somebody today? You look good. You dressed up from the flow up. You got your hair in place. It's all sewn in and glued in. You're looking good. You got your favorite outfit on. And you got those cute shoes on that you kicked off because they're hurting your feet right now. But you're looking good. But spiritually, you're dying. It had a healthy appearance. But it masked an inner decay. And one of the things I learned about church people, we can hide. Our sickness. It's kind of like COVID. You can have COVID and have no symptoms. You can be in church every Sunday and people can't acknowledge or recognize you sick. When you look at Sardis and you look at Laodicea, they are the wealthiest churches. And sometimes the wealthiest churches or the wealthiest people are the sickest. Amen, somebody. So this text opens up. He says, to he who holds the seven stars and the seven spirits. Watch this. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And I've been teaching you, watch this, that he's talking to the church at Sardis. And he says, I'm the one that's holding your pastor in his hands. So envision the fact that right now God is holding me in his hands. And he has seven spirits floating around in the church. In essence, it's seven eyes. And it's interesting, it's the number seven because it's the number of completion. And right now, God has an eye on every one of us. That's why the stuff I'm about to say, you're going to think I was in your house. And I don't even know where you live. But because God is in this house and he's speaking to you right now, he's saying, I'm looking at you. I've been watching you. You looking the part. You looking good. Your vital signs physically are good, but your spiritual signs are not good. This seven spirits, this, this is God's 
ministering spirits. And right now, God's spirit is walking throughout this congregation, touching people, saying, I know what you did last night. Can you imagine if God was with you last night and he saw what you did last night? Can you imagine when you were at the Bayou Classic two weeks ago? He saw you. He saw you in Atlanta yesterday. He saw you in Jackson yesterday. You hid from the pastor. The pastor didn't see you, but the Lord saw you. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. It's, it's interesting. You look at what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to see this in your Bible. If it's there if you haven't torn it out. Verse 14, watch what he says. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong, I'm in Philemon, that's wrong. Hold on. Let me turn over one more page. Hebrews 1, verse 14, watch this. He says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Everybody in here is going to inherit salvation if you're saved. And he says, if you are going to inherit salvation, I've got to send some ministering spirits to talk to you where you are. To minister to you right where you are. I've got to say something to you right where you are. And so you're in here today and God is saying, I got a word for you. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. He says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. God says, look, before you get to heaven, I got something to tell you. Before you get to the throne, I've got something to tell you. And so, God tells John, write to this church at Sardis and tell them, even though you dressed up, even though you look in the part, you still not where you're supposed to be. And don't wait till you get to heaven. Amen, somebody. Are y'all in the house? Watch what he says. I'm back in chapter 3 now. Watch what he says. In verse 2, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know your deeds. Here it is. You have a reputation. Shout back reputation. Good God Almighty. You have a reputation. You have a reputation. Everybody in here has a reputation. Can you say amen? Everybody in here has a reputation. Folk know something about you. And what you used to be. Say amen or ouch, whichever one. Somebody knows your reputation. Your reputation precedes you. My brothers and sisters, it's our reputation that oftentimes gets us in trouble. Because we rely on what we used to be. And I remember when I first came here to this church, its reputation preceded it. I was teaching school at the University of Kansas, and this church was in the textbook I was teaching. All across this country, this church was known. Everybody knew Mount Zion First Baptist Church but me. That's how I got here. I was an unsuspecting sucker. God said, let me get somebody that has no idea of the reputation had no idea of the greatness of the church until I got here but here's the problem when you recognize your greatness you can't live on greatness God is still expecting you to continue to be greater you can't be satisfied with what you did yesterday you got to be better every day 
You got to get to the point where your best is every day. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on the fact you are a civil rights church. You got to keep making new history. And I came to tell somebody, you can't live on what you accomplished yesterday. God wants you to do something new every day. Do something spectacular every day. Do something greater every day. Why? Because God is a great God and every day he gives you brand new mercy. And if he gives you brand new mercy, you ought to be able to do something greater today than you did yesterday. Because when you look at your reputation, you keep trying to go back to what we used to be. And if you like me, some of us used to be some. And you better be glad that folk don't remember what you used to be. Amen, lights. Your reputation, your status, your standing, your prestige. You well known. This was the church to be in. If you're going to be president of Southern University, you had to be a member of Mount Zion First Baptist Church. That ought to tell us something before we choose the next president. Make sure they member here first. Amen, somebody. We were on the radio in 1950. Did you hear what I said? This was the place to be. Any Negro that was somebody, they were in Mount Zion. The rest of them, if Dr. Jemison would hear, would say they were wannabes. So if you were somebody, you were here. The movers and the shakers were here. The trustees were over here. The deacons were over here. Trustees had all the money, but wouldn't give it to the church. The deacons had all the leadership skill, but wasn't giving it in the church. Y'all get that on your way home. Everybody had high seats because you can't sit high and pay low. So we got the reputation. This is big Mount Zion. You can't come to this church unless you have money. Let me check the house. How many of y'all got money now? Let me see. I didn't think so. Everybody broke now. Y'all see that? Everybody broke. Now, I'm the pastor. Everybody want to be broke. We had a reputation of being a great church with giving as the top. But just because you give at the top, doesn't mean you are alive. Say amen or ouch, whichever one fits. I'm, I'm in the text. I'm in the text. He said, I know your reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You're full. Every pew is full, but yet you're dead. Your giving is over the roof, but you're dead. You got nice cars in the parking lot, but you're dead. You're dressed in your St. John, your custom suit, but you're dead. He said, you looked apart, but you're dead. Your reputation is what you used to be. Am I talking to anybody? But watch what he says. Wake up. Here it is. Write this down. He says, wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember what you were. And hold fast. He says, hold fast. And then he says, repent. Lord, have mercy. He says, wake up. Pay attention. This city was captured twice. It was a well-fortified city. It should never have been captured. But it was captured twice. And you know why it was captured? Because the guards went to sleep. And both times they were captured. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Be careful that you are not asleep when you're in service. Because what the enemy wants you to do is be asleep while you are in service because when you miss the word of God you miss what God is doing and you think of yourself more highly than what you ought to he says wake up 
pay attention to what's happening around you. You can't sit and relax on your reputation because you have an enemy. And Peter says it like this in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Your enemy, the adversary, is looking for somebody he can devour. Don't you know he's walking around here now waiting to lull you to sleep, to make you go to sleep while I'm preaching, to distract you so you can't pay attention to your spiritual vital signs. Because when your spiritual vital signs are weak, you sit in the pew and look at me like I'm up here performing, waiting for me to get to the close. He says, you're spiritually in a bad place because you're sitting there hoping Reverend would sit down. You're sitting there mad because he said something you didn't want to hear. That's because your spiritual vital signs are not strong. You're waiting on some blessing and pastor's not telling you about getting blessings. He's telling you about living right. You ever notice all through service, you don't get sleepy. But the minute I get up. Right now, some of you are looking at your phone on Facebook right now. Because you know what? The enemy has caused us to go to sleep when we ought to be bright eyed and bushy tailed, looking for him when he shows up. Am I talking to anybody? He says, Wake up. Be watchful. He says, become what you are not. They will sleep. And he says, wake up. Stay woke. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Because what's happening around you, you get so used to it, you just say, oh, that's just the way it is. Be ready. Don't get ready. He tells them to become watchful. Become awake. Brothers and sisters, When Sardis was taken by Cyrus of Persia and Alexander the Great, it was because the guards went to sleep. And while we are asleep, the enemy is doing his job. Watch this. You got to go vote. Because something is wrong when you won't go vote. When you think your vote does not matter. That's because the enemy has lulled you to sleep. In the 19th judicial system, the JDC, there are 15 judges, eight black. You know what they want? Some of those eight seats. But you're not going to go vote. When you look at Baton Rouge City Court, five judges, three black. You know what they want? Those three black seats. In the First Circuit Court of Appeal, at 12 judges, you know how many blacks? One. John Guidry. And we got one trying to get in. And you hadn't gone to vote yet. Amen, somebody. And in case you don't know, he was here last week. Go figure. 19th JDC Family Court. Four judges. One black. I said this for a reason. 
based on the news, who commits the most crime? Based on the news, who commits the most domestic violence? Who took a baby out of state after killing the mama? You see, when you don't have enough people representing you on the bench, then the laws don't work in your favor from the bench. Did, did y'all get what I just said? But you don't think about why it's important to vote because you've been asleep. He says, listen, I'm going to put amendments on the docket and you're not going to even read them. I'm just going to slide them right on in there. Because you don't even know what they mean. You're just going to just, oh, I ain't going to vote for that. I'm going to skip over that. I'll talk about Jesus next week. I'm trying to get us to the polls this week. Am I talking to anybody? He said, wake up. And then he says, strengthen what remains. You can't neglect what you have. You got to strengthen what you have because if you don't strengthen what you have, you're going to lose that too. Why is it important for us to do our civic duty? Because God knows in God we trust. And I'm going to say it to you again. We need to elect politicians not because they're black, but because they believe what we believe. And if that politician is not a member in anybody's church, find somebody else to vote for. I don't care if they're black, white, red, polka dot, but you ought to find somebody that at least believe in the God that you believe in. Even if they have a different version of your God. I looked at this. He says, you need to strengthen what remains. Watch this. I found your deeds unfinished in my, in the sight of God. See, when you don't finish what God set you out to do, God is not pleased. And God is the one that appoints public officials. God is the one that elects people into public service. God is the one that puts people in your life. God is the one that allows you to be blessed the way you are blessed. And God puts you in front of people to bless you because he wants you to be their people and he wants them to be his people. Am I making sense? Are y'all hearing me? He says, verse 3, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Remember what you heard and hold on to it. It is vital that you hold on to what we've been taught. Our ancestors told, go to school. Hold on to that. Work hard. Hold on to that. Love God. Hold on to that. The stuff we've heard, the stuff we remember, we ought to hold on to it. Because if we don't hold on to it, the devil's trying to take it. Make it plain, Pastor. What's wrong with our children? We didn't hold on to what our ancestors held on to. How can you be uneducated and love God the way they did, and we educated and don't have time for God? We do anything we want to do, everything we want to do, but when it comes to doing what God has said for us to do, that's important. You have a duty to be what God called you to be, even in society. It's not enough to be a good Christian. It's not enough just to go to church. We have responsibility and obligations to serve God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. He says, strengthen what remains. Brothers and sisters, when you have a false sense of security, the enemy will capture you, take you prisoner, 
See, when you think you got enough money that you can make it, that's when the enemy gets you. When you think you've got enough education to be successful, that's when the enemy gets you. See, when you start thinking that you got it made, that's when the enemy slides right up on you and surprises you. Let me check your vital signs. When's the last time you've been to Sunday school? Well, before COVID, Pastor. Really? When's the last time you've been to Bible study? You see, you can tell when the person's vital signs, spiritual vital signs are not good. Check the Sunday school attendance. Check the Bible study attendance. Don't get mad. Don't, don't get mad. Say, help me, Lord. That's what you do. Because see, what you're telling me is you don't need a spiritual checkup. That all you need to do is come to church on Sunday. That's all you need. Sunday, that's all you need. You don't need nothing but Sunday. Let me just come on Sunday. That's, that's all I need. Okay. So you mean to tell me the only time you go to the doctor is when you're sick? I just told you every August I go get a checkup. Not because I'm sick, but because just in case. My numbers have shifted. Did y'all hear what I said? I have got to understand that my spiritual vital signs are far more important than my physical vital signs. Because when you start dropping out of church, your vital signs are low. When you start hitting and missing, your vital signs are low. We got some people who used to go to all the Saints games. They're not going as often now. Used to go to all the Jaguar games. Not going as often now. All the Tiger games. Not going as often now. Why? Because they understand their vital signs. Their spiritual vital signs. Amen, somebody. The world lures us to sleep. But here's what I want you to get. The Lord is coming back. I said he's coming back. He's coming back. Now, you can play with him if you want to. He's coming back, and you won't have time to get right when he gets back. You're going to have to be right before he gets back. Because the book says in 1 Corinthians 15 that, look, when he comes back, you're not going to know. You're just going to hear a trumpet sound, and you're going to be caught up. You won't have time to go get your checkbook. You won't have time to change clothes. You won't have time to check your 401k. You're going to be raptured up. And you're going to have to stand before a throne and give an account of what you've done in this life. He's going to check your temperature. See if you were hot or cold. Because you can't be lukewarm. I talk about that next week, next message. He says, you're going to have to be ready for when he comes back. G. Campbell Morgan says this, they had reputation without reality. I came to give us a reality check today. I don't care what your reputation is. You better check your reality. I've discovered you can be on the church roll and not be saved. Amen, lights. Living names, but dead people. You have a name, but you're doing nothing. You have notoriety, but you've been negligent. You're not in the hospital, you are in hospice. Lord help us. And you know, when they call in hospice, they're saying there's nothing else we can do. It's in the text. He said, look, you are, you are alive, but you're in hospice. I looked at this text. He says the church had reached a new low. It was dominated by sin and false doctrine and unbelief. And he says, wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember and hold fast. And then he says, repent. And repent means to turn around 
It means you're headed in the wrong direction and you need to turn around and go in the right direction. Because here's how you know if you are alive, is there any movement? Is there any responsiveness? Are you eating? Are you drinking? Are you growing? Are you reproducing? Do you have energy? Isn't it interesting? See, the way I know if you are alive, when I say something you agree with, you say amen. In other words, if I'm saying something and you don't agree or you don't have anything to say and you just sit there, I'm assuming you're dead. Because you do know what a dead church is, right? One that doesn't say anything. They're sitting there, they look alive, but they're not saying anything. And see, if God has done anything for you, my Bible says, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And the last time I checked, I was breathing. And because I'm breathing, I have something to say. If I can't get it out of my mouth, my hands will do it. If I can't get it out of my hands, my feet will do it. If you are alive, something ought to happen. Well, Reverend, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm a sponge. I soak it all in. Well, I tell you what, you soak a sponge long enough, it'll drip some drops of whatever is soaked in. Don't tell me you have no response because I'm here to tell you when somebody messes with you and they hurt you, you will cry, won't you? That lets me know you are alive because emotions are just a release of what's on the inside of you. You can holler at a ball game. You can holler for Jesus. What's wrong with that? I mean, if you can say go Jags, you can say go Jesus. I mean, they both go J, you know, hey. I mean, maybe that's what happened yesterday. We didn't say go Jags enough. Oh, no, maybe we should have said go Jesus. Or go Tigers. Maybe that's what happened yesterday. Should have said go Jesus. He says, repent. But he says, remain. And I want you to write this down. You see, this is what I've discovered. And I'm almost done. When there is no friction, there is no movement. And we're too afraid to cause friction. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But here's what I've discovered. If, if there is no friction, then there will be no growth. Amen, lights. My brothers and sisters, you cannot lead out of a lap of luxury. Don't become lax in your living, in your morals, in your love, in your law. And when you recognize that you are dying, do something about it. You cannot be content to rest on your past accomplishments. When we're more concerned with rituals than we are spiritual realities. Focus on social ills of the day rather than the spiritual changes needed in the heart. When we are more concerned with material things than we are spiritual things. When we're more concerned with what men think than what God has said. When we're more concerned with creeds and systems of theology than we are about what God has said in his word. The loss of conviction. That we see today that the word of God speaks against. Brothers and sisters, the denial of the only source of spiritual life, Christ. The church had Sardis, had works, but it had no life. Can you imagine living for the Lord, but you're surrounded by spiritual deadness? Can you imagine the absence of any real saints of the Lord around you? Can you imagine not having somebody sitting beside you, you just in church by yourself? You ever notice church doesn't feel the same when nobody's in there? But when you're next to people and you feel what they feel and see what they see, it's amazing how the spirit will just jump from one pew to the next pew. I love to tell this story. Back when I was in college, I went to Promised Land Baptist Church. I went with this young lady. And, uh, you know, I never, I wasn't much on going to church when I came to Southern. 
I was just too glad to get out of my mom and daddy's house. Don't look at me like that. And so I was liking this little girl, so I went to church with her because that's the only way I could go somewhere with her. I had to go to church with her, so I went to church with her and uh, sat on the pew with her, her grandmama, her mama, then her, and then me. Her grandmama, mama, the girl, then me. The spirit got high in the church, and the grandmama shouted and fell on the floor. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. The mama got up, she started shouting. I said, oh, my God. The girl got up, she shouted, oh, Jesus. I looked around, I said, oh, I don't want that. And it skipped right on past me because I didn't want it. And I came to tell somebody who doesn't want it, I'm here to tell you, if God has done anything for you, you ought to feel something sometime, even if you don't want to. Now I get it all by myself, don't care if you get it or not. I'm glad that he makes me feel the way I feel. I'm glad he touches me sometimes. I'm glad he makes me shout when I don't want to. I'm glad he makes me run when I don't feel like it. I'm glad when he makes me clap my hands when nobody's performing. I'm glad. Because I hadn't learned something. You can't have a relationship with him and don't feel him sometimes. The old folks said it best. I wouldn't have a religion that I couldn't feel sometime. It may not make you run, but it ought to make you say, mm. Brothers and sisters, I got to get out of here. But can you imagine a place that worshiped without any reverence at all? No reverence for God, but you're going to worship. Can you imagine going in and out of a place where there was no spiritual depth at all? Can you imagine going to Walmart and they never have what you want? Can you imagine going to church and they never have what you want? God is saying, look, you've got to come here and you've got to want something sometime. In the conclusion of every one of the letters to the churches, the Lord always concludes with the concept of those who overcome. And I came to tell us today, brothers and sisters, we got to overcome. Check your vital signs and see if you just living or are you just existing. Because God wants us to be at our best. Instead, our life comes from materialism, sports, television, entertainment, and possessions. We may do all the Christian things, send our children to Christian schools, listen to Christian music, and attend a Christian church, but deep within... There is no real hunger for the spirit of God, the word of God, no desire to pray, no interest in the word of God. The psalmist said it like this, your delight ought to be in the Lord. That's Psalm 1. Blessed is the man. You can't be a blessed man or woman if you don't delight in the things of God. You got to love the things of God, not just the things of this world. If this world from will withhold all of its silver, all of its gold, you got to recognize if you never get anything out of this life, get Jesus. Have I got a witness? Brothers and sisters, the Lord told the church of Sardis, what the problem was, and then he told him how to fix it. He said, repent. The choice is up to you, just like it was up to them. You need to fix it this morning. What will your choice be this morning? Brothers and sisters, what are you going to do? Check your vital signs and see. Are you going to change some of your ways? Or are you just going to continue to die one day at a time? Well, I got to leave you. Watch what he says. <laughs> Verse 5. The one who is victorious will, like them, <laughs> be dressed in white. I'll never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. But will acknowledge that the name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says 
to the churches. I like this part. Because he says, I got a few people. Not a lot, but I got a few. And their, so, their, their garments have not been soiled with the wickedness of this world. He says, I got a few folk. And when I check their vital signs, not only are they vibrant, but they are victorious. Not only are they doing well, but they have a real relationship with me. Those garments represent grace. Listen to me when I tell you. Grace is God's resources at Christ's expense. He says, let me tell you what you ought to do. Not put on the latest designer outfit. But he says, you ought to dress yourself. In the garments of praise. You ought to wrap yourself in the grace of God. That you come to grips with the fact no matter what's happening outside. I got something on the inside. And he says your name will not be blotted out. He says you, you got on a white outfit. And it's always amazing to me. I'm, I'm done. It's always interested me <laughs> that some brides will get a white dress representing purity, holiness. They get a white dress and ain't nothing holy about them. You trying to help people think that your reputation is not what you but you know you weren't supposed to be in that white. I'm going to put it where you can get it. So now you take that same picture and you know right now while I'm talking to you some of us it won't be a white robe. You won't be able to pull it over God's eyes. He has seven eyes and he sees. So what I would suggest all of us do, get right so we can go home. I know you don't want to hear it, but I'll be done. I got two more churches to go, then we'll be talking about Jesus for Christmas. But we got to repent. Check your vital signs. See if you enjoy being in church. See if you enjoy being in the Bible study and Sunday school. See if you enjoy reading the word. See if, if you enjoy sharing the word with other people. Because if you don't enjoy it, you may be alive, but you're dying. I'm done. I don't know who you are. It's my job to extend the invitation. Because here's what I know. You can look the part. I am the church. I can look like I go to church. But is the church in me? I can shout. But am I shouting for the right reason? I can celebrate, but am I celebrating for the right reason? Don't miss it, he says. I know what you're doing. You're looking the part, but you're dying. I need to live. I want to live. I need to change the way I live my life. Repent. Come back to him. Let's stand all over this house.